Okay, so we've been to Texas. Circuit of the Americas did not disappoint. And what a brilliant result we've had there because we love these like narrative story arc type things, don't we? And, and Liberty's going to love this. You can put this in a doco, right? Maverick Vinales, the first man to go three for three. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to get three for three. Three different Grand Prix wins. Three different manufacturers in the MotoGP era. Of course, this we talk been talking about this like three for three thing like it's never happened before. It has happened before, just not since two thousand and two when we moved to MotoGP rather than five hundred CC Grand Prix racing. It, there of course have been other riders that have done this. So I don't know why we made such a big deal of it. You know, now that I think about it, we've been talking about it a lot. And then people saying that Mav did it last week when he won that sprint. Like, I'm not having that. But he has done it now, however significant it may or may not be. The main story is he's completed his arc from being a petulant child at Yamaha and throwing his toys out of the pram to now being once again a Grand Prix winner with Aprilia. And the way he did it, he's actually threatening to make me like him, which is weird because until well, until now, I've kind of not been asked if he's still in the championship or not come next year. I just don't really care. I mean, it's just, I was like, how long does he need? You know, it wouldn't have bothered me if he ended up over at World Superbikes or something. But now I'm kind of thinking if he keeps this up, I kind of want him around because it was kind of good. Very good. He's showing a bit of character with his Batman stuff. Everybody loves Batman. So it's obviously the best superhero. And Maverick is embodying that essence of the Batman, right? Whatever he's called, the Batman. I like it. It's, it's okay. I don't mind this. I mean, if a guy that I thought was completely, I was, I was completely uninterested in, I'm now very interested in. Let's talk about it. Obviously, the sprint was the sprint. He did, you know, he did his thing like he did in Portugal, right? Won the sprint. V- very well. While I was thinking, you know, he he looked very likely to do the same on Sunday, he had a bit of a hiccup and he got sent back to about 11th place. And then the way he's then gone and just run everyone down and some of the overtakes were brilliant and got himself to the front, had a bit of a scrap and then just had the quality to just be better than everyone else and pull away a little bit. One up by almost two seconds in the end. Unreal. It was, it was genuinely very good. Genuinely very good. And I, my autofocus keep picking up the helmet here. So I'm going to let me try and get in the way of that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's better. Okay. And I guess when we talk about this now, what we're actually talking about is, yeah, Mav, two races in a row, he's been this good, right? Or two weeks, two Grand Prix weekends in a row. Now, we had the issue. That's going to annoy me. Goodbye. He had his issue in Portugal where he wasn't able to finish the race and he probably wasn't going to win that race anyway. He certainly had the pace. So if you add 20 points to his total there, he's right up there. With Martin, you know, so he sits third at the moment, 56 points, Martin on 80. Martin, who we'll talk about because he's shown a bit of weakness. But if you say he came second or third in Portugal, let's say he came second, which is where he was running, and I think he probably would have come second, 76 points to Martin's 80. I think we have a genuine, genuine title contender here. Now, Mavs have disappointed us so many times in the past, and I'm reluctant to sort of say it out loud. So that there obviously is the possibility that he reverts to type and ends up just being the way he was before come the next round which by the way where are we going next probably should be on top of this stuff with you know a moto gp youtube channel what's the next race all right so we're back on the weekend of the 28th of april so the end of the month we're off to hereth so we have a weekend off if we get to hereth and i'm not saying he needs to go and do that again but if he's still competitive podium competitive i will concede that he is a real title contender although it's hard to see how he wouldn't be at this point but like i said Mav can just go off the boil for no reason. So we'll see how we go. We'll move on to Aprilia here. And now, as always, everything I'm talking about, we're going to cover all Moto3 and Moto2 later and everything in MotoGP here. Maybe even cover a bit of Fantasy MotoGP later on as well. Everything's going to be chaptered below. So go find whatever you need. But it raises the question about Aprilia that now that Mav is in form and this Aprilia looks incredibly good, has it always been this good? And we've been lacking in riders. A lot of people have said that in the past. I was one that was kind of just thinking wherever alasia has got it is probably where it's at because he's just been so good on it. But maybe I've been overrating Alasia a little bit and this bike actually could have got to where it is now. It's like a Ducati, but without the riders. I don't know. Maybe it's, obviously it's not that good, but well, I say it's not that good, but if Mav can do it, what a, what a Quattroar or something would be doing on it, you know? So has this bike always been there? Have Aprilia been let down by their riders this whole time and now that one of them is really turning it on it's like a genuine world beater of a bike perhaps perhaps in the sprint just missing the podium was young pedro costa but he certainly made up for that on sunday second place 
he continues to impress and confirming, all but confirming now that he is, of course, the second coming of our Lord and Saviour, Valentino, just because he has a little bit of character that's enjoyable as well. And when I say things like this, where I think he's more of a Rossi than a Mark, for example, is, you know, we'll talk about Mark later. I never really warmed to Mark as a character, and that might be because I was growing up as a Rossi fan, and I've, maybe I'm a bitter old man with Mark, but I mean, it's not like I don't like the guy. It's just I never warmed to him like it did with Rossi. But Pedro, I never thought I could like a Spaniard this much. Absolute, genuine character, lovable. And then the, the aggressiveness on the bike, takes no prisoners, just wants to mix it with the boys. Looks like he's having fun doing it and has the talent. It's just a genuine talent. And, you know, a bit disappointed that it's another Spaniard, but I actually don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I just, I just, if you take him for him, brilliant anyway mentioned martin earlier he did have a strange weekend for all money was the quickest man out there overdid it a bit in qualifying to the point where he had a crash and then came out and looked like he just looked like he was overriding it when in practice it didn't look like he was overriding it he was just doing the times and just happened to be miles quicker than anyone else and did he get in his own head a bit this weekend the expectation hype around his own pace i mean he was just smashing everyone no one could get anywhere near him and then somehow he's ended up off the podium on Sunday. And you have to expe expect that if Mark finished, he probably would have finished ahead of him as well. What happened? And is Martin as quick as he can look? And is this where it comes into this idea that Ducati might not be that... I mean, they're not in a hurry to make him a factory rider, are they? They're waiting and waiting. And you think sometimes, you know, leading the World Championship, came second last season. Clearly, I think, on pure pace, the quickest guy on a Ducati. Why is there this hesitance? Other than maybe, you know, maybe they have a, maybe a bias towards Italian riders. I don't know. There is a hesitance. And maybe they're seeing something there that we obviously don't get to see. Something behind the scenes where he has this, I don't know, he should, how do he not, how is he not at least on a podium here on Sunday? How is he not winning this Grand Prix comfortably? Or at least up there with Mav? Because they were on similar, Mav was the only one that had close to his pace in practice. Mav's gone on with his head switched on. And turn that into a well perfect weekend pole to sprint win to Grand Prix win, and Martins ended up in this weird. You no, know, he he got in his own head in qualifying, so he's ended up on the second row, the back of the second row. Picked up a third place on Saturday, and then finished off the podium on Sunday. How? How? So there's something there, and then now when you look at like oh, oh it's odds on like Banyai is not going anywhere. Martin, you have to promote him or you lose him basically what's going to happen. And Bastianini's going to have to take a step back to Pramac or try and find a ride somewhere else. Maybe Aprilia go after him. I don't think it's that easy anymore. Look, it's one race. But Bastianini has had a solid round last round and he's finished ahead of Martin this weekend. This kid is building. If this goes on another Grand Prix or two where Martin sort of shows a bit of weakness and Bastianini kind of has this, I mean, it's not outrageous pace. It's not outrageous anything, but it's just this steady, like consistent, solid. And if he gets it right, you know, he can win Grand Prix. But if he, when he's not getting it right, he's not having brain explosions like Martin is here. Is Bastianini still a chance at keeping his seat? Kind of unlikely, but is he? I genuinely think so. I think Ducati probably prefer him. Otherwise, they'd have pulled the trigger trigger almost already, right? But, you know, just a bit of food for thought. Maybe I am overreacting. Maybe it is a knee-jerk reaction from me just to this weekend. Maybe it'll be turned around when we get to Hareth. We'll see. Now, let's talk about Marquez. <sighs> Will he be happy with this weekend? I mean, he probably say he is. Second in the sprint. There was no touch in Mav, so you say that's a very good result. Maybe over-celebrated with his dance party. <laughs> um, <laughs> Saturday afternoon on the podium. Um, but, you know, a bit of over-the-top stuff. The Americans love that, don't they? So I'm sure they enjoyed that. Um, I found it a bit cringy myself, but maybe that's the character that I don't warm. Maybe that's my bias. That's my bias. That's what I was talking about earlier. Where I don't warm to him. I don't know what it is. Did he get ahead of himself going into Sunday? I've heard his explanation for what happened with the crash. He had an issue on the brakes, had to have a few grabs at it, and then... It let go on him. It, it was, it did look like one of those ones where it's like, it went kind of early. So for those ones, I'm always a little bit reluctant to blame the rider because sometimes they just like, you're still, you're not even leaning that much and it just goes. It's like, well, has he really done anything that wrong there? It could be very minimal. He'll be encouraged by the pace, but at a circuit where 
he knows he's so quick. There'll be a bit of disappointment there. That that was one. That's points that have gotten away. And it leaves him on just 36 points for the season. Whereas though, that could have been a big chunk of points. Could have been a podium. And then you'd have to think, well, Mark in that situation can still pull something off. But it's left him a fair way behind. But the good thing is not that far behind still the likes of Bastianini in second. It's just Martin who's a bit ahead. But like I said, there's a bit of something going on with him as well. So we'll see. It's going to be very interesting how this plays out. I'm not completely convinced by Martin. Mark, can he do anything from there? Possibly still. And I think in the Grand Prix, because he knows it's a circuit he loves so much and he's so good at, a few of the moves, I won't say desperate. I won't say desperate. They were certainly aggressive. But there was a couple where I thought that maybe wasn't on. And he just went late, big lunge, took himself wide and another guy. It's just like, just wait, just wait. Like, if you're that good here, you'll be able to just sit in behind that guy for another few corners and then line up something measured and, you know, but he was just like, no, fuck, I'm going now. And I just felt it was a bit old Mark, right? It was old Mark. It's like, oh, Mark, has he got his head switched on here? Is he calmed down a little bit just so that he can get used to the bike? And, you know, he's got a better bike now. Maybe he doesn't have to be that desperate because the Ducati will keep him competitive for longer throughout the race. And it's just felt to me like it was one of those, I need to go now. But he probably didn't. He probably didn't. So he had a couple of moves like that. And then once he got in the lead, obviously he's let it go. I don't know. Tell me where you think Mark was at this weekend because I'm half thinking he'll be like the pace is there and I'm half thinking, but was he hanging on? And that's why he was pushing so hard. And that's what cost him. I don't know. And that's why I was making late sort of desperation style moves. Let me know. Let me know where you think he's at. Other performers from the weekend. Peko. I don't know if whether or not it's worth talking about Pecco here because he's had a real lukewarm weekend. Fifth place in the Grand Prix, eighth in the sprint. He didn't qualify that well, second row. And where does it leave him? 30 points off Jorge Martin. Is this just one of those inevitable, he's going to have a lean year type of things? You get one of those throughout your career every now and then, even when you are at your best. So maybe, but he certainly isn't. Like he, I've got to say, he looks nowhere near as good as Bastianini at the moment. Of those last two races, Bastianini's been quite good, I think. And he looks well off the pace of Martin. We're getting round one already, and that he won there. So, again, is this a knee-jerk reaction? Is he actually off the boil? It just, once you see this kind of lack of pace, that's almost the worst thing, because it's like, well, where's it going to... You start to wonder where it's going to come from. But, like I said, lukewarm performance from him this weekend. Digi, after a bit of a unlucky Saturday, had a good result on Sunday. I mean, I don't know. Anyone else you want to talk about? No one else really caught my eye. I thought Jack was was good on Saturday and then just absolutely bombed on Sunday. Again, part of the frustration with him. And I guess, you know, positive results. Maybe the track house guys will be happy with, you know, Ralph Fernandez getting a top 10. He looks like he's doing enough for me to hold on to his seat. He's showing enough pace for me. But then they are consistently being left behind by the factory boys. So I was like, could they be doing better? Could they be doing better? Okay. Oh, the other one I wanted to mention was Morbidelli because... Finally, finally looked like he was not the slowest Ducati this weekend. On pure pace and race pace, he was not the slowest of the Ducati riders, but had a crash on Sunday. So he really needs to look at, with the position he's in, he's under a lot of scrutiny. When you're not the slowest guy and you think you can finish it on pace ahead of another couple of Ducati riders, you probably just got to go finish that race. But he'll be encouraged third goal on that bike and he's already, I think, moving himself up. And he wasn't necessarily on pace that much slower than Peko all weekend. So I think he'll be encouraged. Now, in the All Japan Cup, one of our favorite parts of this season, it's just brilliant, the All Japan Cup, although we do have a runaway leader. And if you want to know what how I'm scoring the All Japan Cup, I'm doing however they finish in that order, because there's six of them we're awarding old F1 style points, six riders, 10 points for winner, six for second, four for third, three, two, one. Now, many DNFs this weekend, so they don't score. DNFs don't score. Fabio has won his third race in a row in the All Japan Cup. He goes to 30 points. We only had one other finisher in the All Japan Cup this weekend. It was Luca Marini. Picks himself up six points. So he moves to an equal third with Yoan Zarko in the All Japan Cup. You love to see it. Luca Marini stayed on the bike and he almost picked himself up a genuine world championship point, finishing 16th. He did finish behind Alex Marquez, who also crashed, I believe. So take that as you will, but he's still a long way off the pace. I mean, the next on track, I think Augusto Fernandez was the next guy up the road and he's about six seconds back from him. I mean, other than Marquez, 
who crashed. Marquez would have been way further up. So he would have been six seconds behind Augusto Fernandez, which is a story in itself because Augusto Fernandez, that is showing that he is absolutely well off the pace. I think he's a genuine, one of the genuine favorites on the grid to lose his ride for next season. But yeah, no other finishes in the All Japan Cup. Uh, so it stands like this. Fabio, 30 points. Mir, 10. Marini, 8. Zarco, 8. Rins, 7. Taka, 5. Now let's talk about MotoGP Fantasy because we don't talk about this very much on here and a lot of people did tell me they'd, they'd like to see updates on the fantasy thing. So let's have a look. On Friday night after practice, I did make some trades. I traded out Bastianini and Binder. Thank God I traded out Binder for Maverick and Jorge Martin. That has worked out pretty well for me. I scored, where's it telling you points? <laughs> It's a terrible layout, I think, this this website. Like, it should be obvious. Like, where is your points? Scored 151 points. I think that's quite good. Now, I did imagine if Martin had actually done what he was supposed to do this weekend. I've been flying. So, my silver, they were my gold riders. My silver riders were Pedro and Digi, who I've had since the start. And I obviously have Ducati as the constructor. So, good weekend for me there. Anyone else that made those trades, well done. It turns out it would actually would have been better off, I think, with Pedro as a gold rider than Martin, but you're not to know. But as always, my recommendation is always wait till at least after Friday practice. If you can wait till after Saturday practice, do it. I always will forget because qualifying so early in the day now that if I don't all wait till Saturday morning, I then forget the qualifying's on in the morning and then I miss the lockout. So I like to do it on a Friday afternoon slash evening. If you didn't get on Maverick this weekend, are you getting on him for next weekend for the next race? Because threatening to be a force, isn't he? Threatening to be a force. But that's how we uh, ended that week. And that's all for Moto GP for me for now. If I missed anything, is there anything else you think was important that I didn't talk about? Chuck it in the comments. I'll get back to you. I always reply to the comments. Now, what the hell happened in Moto2? Well, for starters, it looks like we have a new Moto2 star emerging. And it's one that a lot of people did predict at the start of the season. Um, Sergio Garcia, for a solid first season, he really showed pace. Again, out of that little trio that came out of Moto3, the graduates from that season, Garcia, Foggia, and Guevara. It is clear in a way Garcia looks the most suited to Moto2. Although Dennis Foggia did have a good weekend, which was really good to see. I, I really like the guy, and I think it was brilliant to see him have a strong weekend, finish sixth. Oh, we will mention quick. Joe Roberts, brilliant home Grand Prix. Threatened to win it at points, but made a mistake in there and dropped back a little bit and had to make the time back up, but could have been better for him. Uh, Fermin go third. His teammate Lopez in fourth. Ramirez, Bodja, Ayagura. Aaron Kinnett, ninth. He still will be quick at points during the season. Um, but yeah, as we move through... Pretty much everything else, as you'd expect. Dennis Onchu finished a long way off it this weekend. So, But first season, you're going to get that every now and then. How does it leave them in the World Championship? Sergio Garcia, two points ahead of Joe Roberts. It still is not working out the way we expected. It's kind of a surprise who's at the top. And Joe Roberts being so close to the top. If it keeps up like this, he's going to give track house racing a headache. There will be a push now to get him into MotoGP. If he has a good season, it'll be like, we need to get him in there. Track house with improvements from Raul Fernandez. If he keeps doing well like i said he looks good to keep his seat based on the pace they will have to make a hard call on him or Oliveira. you could say look he could he go anywhere else i think the other like i mentioned earlier augusto fernandez seat is definitely up for grabs will they try and manufacture though an american rider in the american team i think they would prefer that but get him on the grid if he does does well you know that's what they'll want i still don't think he'll stay this competitive for the rest of the season though i can't see it but it could happen but yeah, Fermin Aldeguer still, he starts the season, his first two races, there was obvious reasons why he ended up not having a great weekend, although his second race was good, but he had to battle against it, did, did need to get to where he was. And then here on a completely like straight up, where is he at? He's come third, albeit to a sensational performance from Sergio Garcia and a great home ride from Joe Roberts, which we don't know yet if he's going to be able to do everywhere. But do you still have him as your favorite, Fermin? I still think he is probably the standout talent there. But from what we've seen from Sergio Garcia in the past, you know that if this kid gets it hooked up, he's really good. So is Sergio Garcia the main threat? I'd say so. I'd say so. But yeah, tell me what you thought of this race. It was good, I thought. I had I had a bit of a story to it with Joe Roberts and, and that. And was he coming back to try and win the race? Then he dropped back and then he got back into second. And, you know, Sergio Garcia was brilliant. So, yeah, nice race. Let's move on to Moto3. David Alonso, off like a rocket. They never saw him again. The interesting thing about this race, which I actually really enjoyed this race for a race where someone got out in one by four seconds or something. Five seconds in the end it's got there over Olgado. It was building to something. And I thought it was a cool little cat and mouse with Colin Vaya then starting to hunt David Alonso down towards the end. And it's a shame that 
Colin crashed because, and I'm a huge fan of Colin Vi. I think he's brilliant. It's a shame he crashed because it really looked like it was, it would have been one of those ones where like a lap or two to go, he may have caught him. And then we could have had a bit of a scrap for the lead, which would have been great. But that crash then affected the guys behind him. And then they lost a lot of time to Alonso. So we, I'm not saying Alonso got lucky. He was brilliant. But they probably had the pace to come back to him. But then again, in the last few laps, their pace all dropped off as well. So maybe the point of tyre wear that he hit, they all hit too. Maybe Colin Vi would have hit that as well and just not been able to just make up that last sort of second but yeah i thought it was an entertaining race as always in moto 3 the boys scrapping behind david alonso that was that was a great little scrap as well piqueras another one another spaniard jeez another one Ah, oh, well he looks good anyway this kid and you know he had been promising um i think like him and jacob ralston i was comparing together a lot in the last couple of weeks and they have been pretty close but this week obviously piqueras had a bit more than ralston but ralston had a good result as well hey mate so decent result for him too, but Pekeris looks real good. Yamanaka was entertaining in this one as well, so I really enjoyed watching him. Joel Kelso had a crash and still came seventh. And early in the race, Joel Kelso's like trying to overtake people. So brilliant. I mean, he stuffed it up, but he's had a go. Brilliant. You know, that's what we want to see. Bit of that Aussie grit. This is where Moto3 is at at the moment. It's just a weird championship because you've got Olgado and Alonso clearing away ahead of everyone else, 65 and 63 points respectively. Only them two are one races this season. And then your next best rider is 37 points back. And it's Joel Kelso whose best race finish is fifth. <laughs> it's just one of those ones that if you just stay on and pick up top six, seven finishes all year, you're probably going to finish in the top five of the championship comfortably. I mean, big factor in this was Rueda didn't get to compete because he ended up with appendicitis. It's going around. So you have to imagine he, I mean, you can't, I'm, in Moto3, you don't know. It could have just tire sided out of the first corner. Who knows? But Or got caught up in an incident. But let's say he picked up a handful of points. That maybe would have him a bit closer than what Kelso is in the championship. And I still think he looks like he will have a say in the championship. Not that I think he's going to be able to make up all those points to Olgado and Alonso, but I think he will affect the amount of points they get. He'll be finishing second ahead of them sometimes or you know, taking points off them. So, yeah, but it is strange. That third in the world championship, Joel Kelso, with only one top five finish. But yeah, it was a good weekend of race. It was good to have it back. And it was good that we got such a good Grand Prix because it was an absolutely brilliant race on Sunday in MotoGP. After having a few weeks off, that's what you want. You just want to come back and it's a good race and you enjoy it. And that's exactly what we got. And yeah, we'll be off to Jerez next. And then I think we're Le Mans after that, which is exciting because I'm going to that one. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, if there's anything I forgot to talk about or I missed in my notes here, that you thought were big talking points from the Grand Prix, jump in the comments and let me know and we'll discuss there. On the screen at the moment, there's going to be another couple of videos for you to watch. Uh, so click on them and give me some views. We'll see you on the next one.